Okay, well, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kent Branch September 2023 educational presentation. My name is Cindy Robichaud, and I am part of the Kent Branch operating team and your host for this evening. Thank you for joining us. So we do have a couple of housekeeping items. Our presentations are recorded and available on our Kent Branch YouTube channel, which is open to anyone. Your microphones and cameras have been turned off, but we welcome your questions. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, you will see the bar with the chat icon. If you click on it, the chat box will open. Here you can type your message or questions for us or for the speaker. Angela Churchill is monitoring the chat for us tonight. So thank you, Angela. Before we begin tonight's presentation, Bob Daly, a member of the Lenape Nation and a Kent Branch member offers a territory acknowledgement. The land on which we gather, learn, and play is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapawak, and Potawatomi peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nations of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, the Caldwell First Nation, Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point, Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Delaware Nation at Moraviantown, the Muncie Delaware Nation, and Wapool Island First Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban indigenous population who make the cities of southwestern Ontario home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Great, thank you, Bob. So for anyone joining us for the first time, let me tell you a bit on, about Ontario Ancestors. Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, is a nonprofit registered charity which was founded in 1961. It is the largest genealogical society in Canada with a mission to encourage, bring together and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. Be sure to visit the website to learn more about the resources and support available to assist you in your family history research. So Ontario Ancestors has over 30 branches and several special interest groups all across Ontario. And we are the Kent branch. We're the local family history group here in Chatham-Kent. We offer education and assistance to researchers and our mission is to promote and prom promote and preserve the local history and family history of Kent County. Our family history library is located on the second floor of the Chatham-Kent Public Library in Chatham. It holds, holds over 45 years worth of historical and genealogical resources for Chatham-Kent. We are open to the public on Fridays and Saturdays from 1 p.m. till 5 p.m. and we also try to accommodate others by appointment. We always like to connect with people who are interested in genealogy and local history. You can connect with us at this email. You can also join our Kent Branch Facebook group which has over 850 people who are interested in genealogy and Chatham Kent's history. We also have a very comprehensive website with lots of resources for both our branch members, but also for the general public. Here are our upcoming fall events. On September the 25th at 6 p.m., we will be offering an in-person drop-in session to practice the find finding land records on, from on land website and the family search website. After tonight's presentation, we should have lots of insight into finding land information, so we want to get together and do a hands-on session. We will be meeting in our Kent Branch Family History Library in the Chatham Kent Public Library. So please bring your laptop and a location that you would like to search. Space will be limited, so if you want to join us, please send an email to reserve your spot. 
Then on October 13th, we will be online again with Eric Skillings, who will discuss the timeline of the South Buxton and Romney pastoral charges, including the church's histories and the early families of those areas. Then on November 4th, which is a Saturday, we are planning a road trip to the community of Blenheim to visit the Blenheim Military Museum and Resource Center. The museum is packed, not only with amazing military resources, but also many local family histories as well. We will have lunch in town and we're hoping that the Legion will accommodate us. And then we will wrap up the visit um, to the with a visit to the Blenheim Heritage House Museum. We plan to meet up in Blenheim around 9.30 a.m. and we plan to arrange carpooling from Chatham. For more information or to let us know that you're interested in coming, again, send us an email. Now let's get to tonight's presentation. We are very excited to have Jacqueline Canuck joining us all the way from Salt Lake City, Utah. Jacqueline is a United States and Canada research specialist at the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. She is an accredited genealogist for Ontario and Quebec research and graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree, bachelor degree in family history and genealogy. Her research specialties include the United States South Central Region and Canada. So let's give Jacqueline a warm virtual welcome. Jacqueline, thanks for joining us. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll, let, I'll turn it over to you and let you take it away. Great, thank you so much. Let me get this share. All right, does that look all right? Looks great. Perfect. Well, welcome everybody today. Um, like Cindy was saying, I am a research specialist with Family Search. I serve at the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I get to help tons of guests who come through doing their own family history as well as volunteer teaching volunteers how to do family history work as well. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Ontario land records. Uh, I love working in Ontario, um, the land records especially. They're, they have a lot of different tips and tricks to them, uh, but they're really a lot of fun to work with once you get a hang of them. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the genealogical value of land records, how to use the records, finding the different records, especially we're going to focus on finding records on family search today. I'm going to walk you through a quick case study of finding some land records on family search, and then we're going to break out and do a live search of some records that uh, Cindy actually sent over to me ahead of time. So let's get started today with the genealogical value of Ontario land records. Uh, you might be asking yourself, why should I be looking for land records? What importance are they to me? Uh, well, land records are obviously records that document ownership of ram, land. Uh, they talk about transferring land between ancestors. They also talk about land that is being acquired from the crown, uh, depending on the time period or who was purchasing it. Land records can include a lot of great things, such as where and when your ancestors may have resided, any spouses, heirs, neighbors, or other relatives. Maybe they include a previous residence. As you're trying to find your ancestors, you know where they ended up at a certain point, but you don't know where they came from beforehand. The land records might actually give you where they were living prior. They also tend to give occupations, as well as they give different relationships to different loyalist ancestors. This can be especially helpful for those who are searching for their loyalist ancestry. And lastly, they talk about military service, depending on the land records that you're looking at. Uh, going along with the genealogical value of the land records, what are you going to find in them? Why are they good records to use? Firstly, they are a great locator tool. A lot of people in Canada own land, and a very high percentage of the population are named in these land records. Uh, the availability of land attracted a lot of immigrants to Canada and also encouraged westward expansion. So land ownership was generally reported in the area as soon as settlers began to arrive, which makes it a great and valuable tool, especially the earlier you get in time. They're also great help with immigration issues. Many immigrants came to Ontario to claim land that was available. 
So land ownership was generally recorded very soon after they arrived here. As you're working with different loyalist records in Ontario, this is especially the case. And we can talk about some loyalist records later on. You might also find probate information in the land records. Sometimes wills were copied into deed books um, instead of the probate records. It kind of depends on when probates were even made at the time. They could have been all recorded in those land books that you're trying to search for. They also give a lot of details that will lead to more records. They give details of relationships, leading you to thoughts of who are these people? And you can then search them, see if they're relatives or maybe other neighbors. It can talk about a wife giving up her dower right. Um, it could talk about a father giving land to his son. They all give hints and tips about the people around them. These are also a great record substitute. As we talked about a little bit before, uh, land records were generally started when the area began to be settled. So land records generally began to be recorded around 1760s. Obviously, it depends on which area you're living in, which area you're searching in, when they actually started. Um, but they began as early as the 1760s. These are great record substitutes for census records. Census records didn't really even start until you have that partial in 1842, and they didn't actually start doing full censuses in Ontario until about 1851. A civil registration, that doesn't even begin until 1869. There are some marriages starting around 1801 and going throughout that time, but uh, until 1869, you don't have a lot of civil information, which you might be able to find some hints and clues at in the land records. Tax records don't begin until about 1793 for a limited amount of townships, uh, but most didn't actually begin to be recorded until the 1820s or even the 1830s. So again, the 1760s covers a lot of the points where you're not getting records for taxes. And that's the same deal with probate records as well. Uh, so land records are really great record substitutes to try to help locate your family and understand the family dynamics around. Let's transition now to how to use Ontario land records. To start with, it's important to kind of get an understanding of how the land was surveyed. You're going to be dealing with a lot of different legal jargon, a lot of different wording as you're looking at land records. So it's important to know how was the land surveyed and what's the terminology used that I'm going to be looking at in the records. Uh, in Ontario, there's uh, in Canada, there's a few different land systems being used. The first one is the Dominion land system. This is generally for the western areas, the western provinces, um, and they're very familiar if you've ever searched in the American land publics uh, system. It's very similar. There's different townships with different square miles, and they're all broken down from that point. Uh, river lot systems are also a big uh, system used. This is generally used uh, in the New France time period as they were long narrow lots that ran perpendicular to the ri major rivers and waterways. Uh, people generally crowded around the rivers because that was the main means of transportation, the main means of trade. It was a, a great way to be connected with the rest of the community. The patchwork system uh, this kind of a use of natural features at the beginning and end of a boundary. So people would talk about referring to an oak tree on the edge of a riverbed, or they would talk about the big boulder um, along this path. Uh, there's a lot of odd shaped sizes, odd shapes made, which is why they kind of call it patchwork. Uh, it's kind of just a bunch of different random shapes kind of all meshed together. And those are mainly found kind of the Atlantic provinces, especially in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Which brings us to the last one we're going to talk about, which is the rectangular lot system. This is a huge one that is used in Ontario, which is what you'll find most of your land records talking about. The rectangular lot system, um, this is kind of a picture of what this kind of looks like. This is Haldeman Town, uh, County in Ontario. Uh, in the rectangular lot system, a township is kind of used as the larger, largest component of land description. The townships are then kind of subdivided into a series of lots in a uniform size. The reason it's called rectangular lot system is because these are all made of little rectangles. Um, and these rectangles are kind of ordered by lots and concessions. That's how they, they're numbered along a grid in order to determine what rectangle uh, gets what column. And we'll look at a quick example of how to 
talk about townships, lots, and concessions. So townships, those are your boundaries of different sizes, all divided in long strips of land called concessions. So here's closer up on that map of Haldeman. And you can see right here, you have South Cayuga Township. Over here, you have Moulton Township. There's a lot of other townships you might be able to see those different, uh, different names on this map here. Then it breaks down into your concessions. So those are long strips of land. They are in any sort of direction, but they are identified on these different maps with Roman numerals. So if we come back to our map, you can see right there, there's a little Roman numeral I circled and it goes off to the right. But you can also see up a little bit north, there's some more Roman numerals of a different township going off over to the left being numbered. Uh, so it's really important you kind of look at these different maps to kind of determine um, when you're looking at your land description, where actually is your land located? Then they're broken down into lots. And those run perpendicular to your concessions and identified with uh, numerals. So if we come back here to our map, you can see there's a different, they're not Roman numerals, they're just numbers. And they go perpendicular to our blue arrows here and right there as well. So now that we kind of talked a little bit about how the land is surveyed, let's talk about some types of land records that you're going to see as you're doing different Ontario land research. Uh, the big ones are going to be your land registry records. Those are typically your deeds, your mortgages, uh, different land patents might also be in these records. Uh, then your abstract index books. Onland has a great portion of these abstract index books online. I believe Cindy talked about that a lot of you have familiarity with using Onland in these abstract books. The Crown land records are also a great source of records. That these are the different land patents as people were applying to the Crown to get land uh, initially. And then you have the Aaron Bezzi records as well, uh, which talk about different records and they kind of go through situations of military service or talking about when land is kind of being uh, a, a point of contention between two different people. They'd often go to these and have uh, different records created saying who actually owns the land and trying to get uh, claim to different land records. And obviously there's going to be a lot of other land records out there, but these are the main four that you'll probably come across. So looking at land registry records, uh, these are records of person-to-person -person land transfers. So they could be any sort of things, whether they're mortgages or whether they're deeds. Uh, it's important to kind of read through and get an understanding for what each land record entails. As you're looking at these land records, be aware that there's different name indexes in each collection. Um, sometimes, depending on the township or the county, they may have made county-wide or township-wide indexes. Or there might be indexes at the beginning of each and every volume of land books. So I'll look a little bit closer at this land registry entry. This is a land entry for Huey Nelson. Um, you can kind of see right in here that he is listed being from Detroit in Michigan. So although he's from, he's living in Detroit, he's selling the land up in Ontario and he's selling it to John Thorne Griffin, who's um, actually from Ontario. And it kind of goes through and talks about the amount of money that he's selling it for. And then it goes and talks about the actual tract of land, giving the lot number. So you can see it says lot number three down here. Um, and it goes through the whole land description. So you, then you can actually go and pull out a map and locate where the land actually is. Next, we talked about some abstract index books. These are the index books organized by the township, then by concession number, and then lot number. Um, these show the history of property ownership in the area. So if we look up this one a little bit closer, this is actually land for Walston Township. Um, and you can see up at the top, it's for lot number five of the third concession. Uh, and going from here, you can see it starts with the Crown land as a patent. And then William actually ended up selling the land. You can see these different as deeds. It kind of shows what instrument, what type of land record um, is being used to transfer the land around. Uh, then we want to talk a little bit about Crown land records. So these are records um, about land transactions from the Crown. Uh, typically, they're arranged by different townships and then the concession number and lot number. So again, it's really important to kind of use your 
abstract index books and use that location of your concession number and lot number to be able to locate any Crown Land records that you're looking for. This is an example of one of the Crown Land records you can get um, for here. This is just a one petition here for a grant in Hamilton Township in Northumberland County. Uh, you can get a lot of really great information about the person here, as well as it gives you the exact uh, dimensions of the land that he's trying to acquire. And here we have the Aaron Devesi books or Devesi books. Uh, these are land dispute settlement packets, like I was saying before. They can include a number of different types of records in them, from testimonies, letters. They may have affidavits from neighbors or proof that they were doing stuff on the land. It's basically people who are trying to say that they own this land. Uh, you can kind of see this. This is an example of one here. It actually is a letter uh, amongst 20 other pages for this exact case, all discussing the entitlement to land by a Nicholas Brizzy. And his letter actually details the property ownership of the land, talks about his marriage to the widow of a Joseph Day, lists all of the widow's four children with all of their ages and birthplaces, which some of the children were actually born in the States as well. And the, he was saying that this, uh, the letter was basically all in an effort to obtain the rights to keep a part of the land that was given to a child who passed away. So one of Joseph Day's children passed away and it would be a stepchild of Nicholas Brizzy, so he was trying to say why he should be able to get that land still. Uh, and again, it goes on for about 20 more pages after that. So after you've kind of gotten the land records and you're reading through it, it's important to evaluate the new information you're getting. Um, go through the genealogical value that you're finding. Read through the entire document. Um, after you've read through the entire document, read it again. Pull out key information and key people. Any listing of people that are listed in the document, I like to underline or highlight. Any dates that you're finding, underline and highlight and pull it all out so you understand what you're getting from the document. Go through and evaluate the record. Ask yourself questions. We'll go through some questions you might want to ask yourself. Uh, it's good to also compare the information you're finding with previously known information and compare it with your research goal. Have you gotten some new insight to your research goal? Have you learned more about the family? Is there any kind of conflicting information that you're finding? And again, read and evaluate it again. I found so many times where not only myself, but other people I've helped at the library, they've read through a document once and moved on. But as they read it back a second time with me, we've actually pulled out a lot of information that was their whole research goal. They already had the record that they needed to answer a question. They just didn't read it thoroughly enough. And after you've done all that, Ask yourself, where should you look next? So as you're evaluating the questions you might want to ask yourself, who created the record? This can help determine the reliability of the information you're finding. Um, so who created the record in land cases? Or was it the clerk or was it a surveyor? When was the record created? How soon after this event was the record created? You want to maybe look for dates when the land was purchased and when the document was recorded. This might account for any errors that you might finding or inconsistencies in the information. Why was this record created? This can help determine what information you might see in the record. So if you're looking at a loyalist petition, there are better chances for family members to be listed as they had to prove that they deserve the land. Whereas land registry records might not have as much genealogical information. What's the condition of the records? Are there any rips and tears? Was there any water damage? This also includes looking out for different handwriting in different parts of the document. A lot of times a clerk would come back later in time and write notes in the sidelines. Um, so look out for the different handwriting. It could uh, indicate that records were amended at different points in time. Is there any conflicting information with any of your previous records? If so, what records could you need to resolve the conflict? Is this an original or a derivative record? Uh, is it a digital index, an abstract? Is it some sort of compiled record or any other sort of copied work? Uh, and on the, whatever it's possible, it's always, get, it's always good to get a copy of the exact original record before you evaluate any further. Is it a primary or secondary information within? Uh, generally in land records, the primary information is going to be your land description, 
when the land is purchased any bordering neighbors, whereas the secondary information may be family relationships, occupations, ages, uh, previous residence of the buyer. Ask yourself, what other records could this lead me to? And this is kind of a case-by-case -case basis based on the information you're reading. Uh, do they hint at any sort of military service? Do they hint at where you could find the family in the census record? Or does it indicate any previous land ownership or immigration? It's really good to read through the information you're finding and ask questions constantly. Let's get on to finding the Ontario land records now. That's a big reason of why you guys all wanted to kind of listen to the classes to find your own ancestors in the land records. So the first question before you even look at land records is, do you have enough clues to be able to use the land records? Have you used the censuses? Oftentimes those give the county, might give a district and a township uh, that you should be looking for land records in. It's also good to check local indexes for your surname uh, if there's any other family members who are purchasing land. Do the probate records say anything about land being given away? If so, it's good to try to check the land records and you might be able to track the land ownership back to when they originally purchased the land. Uh, if you found them any, in any military service records, such as being a loyalist, that could be a big clue to start searching the land records. There are some about five main resources that I'd recommend as you're looking for some land records. The first is Library and Archives Canada. Uh, they have a bunch of different land records, such as land petitions. Uh, they have some Upper Canada land books, and they have a lot of those commission records for the disputed land settlements. Uh, they have a lot of really great records that are actually digitized and available uh, through the Heritage, their digitization project company, and they are linked through LAC's website. So these are really great collections that you might be able to try searching for your family in. Family Search has a lot of great abstract index books land registry records. Uh, we also have big collections of township papers and Crown Land Department records. Uh, these are all can be found through the catalog and we'll kind of go through an example of how to find them in a second. Ancestry also has some great land records. Uh, they have a, a collection called the Loyal Ontario. These are references, to, these make re references to land grants um, made to the sons and daughters. They're arranged kind of systematically under the names of the loyalist parents. And in them are different references to uh, orders and councils. Uh, and they might be able to provide the case numbers for you to start looking for in different land records or in crown land records. And they also have a great gazetteer. Um, and the database actually lists more than 17,000 different individuals that have been extracted from different atlases through Ontario from 1875 to 1881. It's not a complete transcription, but uh, it really can help you get started, especially if you're not sure where to look. The Archives of Ontario obviously has a lot of great land records, uh, and they also have some of the second Air and Devicey Commission case files from 1804 to 1895. Um, and so again, they have a lot of great crown land records into them. However, they are not really digitized on their site. Uh, a lot of the Archives of Ontario land records have been digitized by FamilySearch and are available on the FamilySearch website. So we'll look some more through there as well. And then lastly, we've talked a lot about OnLand. Um, that's the Ontario Land Property Records Portal. And they have great abstract index books and a lot of them bring it all the way to modern times as well. Um, which things on family, the abstract index books on family search don't do. So use all these different websites to your advantage uh, and look through those different collections here. So let's actually go through an example of how to find some land records. We're going to start by talking about the Co family. Uh, this is the Co family that we started with. Arthur W. Co was married to a Lillian A. Moon, and he had two children, William C. Co and Lillian R. Co. Um, and what we knew about Arthur was very little. All we knew was his two children. He was in Ontario, and we actually had found him in a census. So let's start to build our information about him. In the 1901 Canada census, Arthur was listed as being born the 2nd of September, 1856 in England. His immigration is listed as being in 1859. He belonged to the Church of England. He was a minor, and he was li living with his wife, Lillian his son, William, and his daughter, Lillian. 
As we proceed back to the next census in 1891, he's listed as A. W. Co. He was 37 years old, which gives an approximate birth year of 1857. He's listed as being born in England, and his father and mother were also born in England. He has the same religion of the Church of England, and he's living with L. A. Co. His wife, W. C. His son, and L. R. His daughter, which all kind of works together with what we knew in the last census that we looked at. Then in 1881, we find him again as Arthur Coe. He's 24 years old, born in England, belonging still to the Church of England. Um, he's a speculator, which for those who don't know, they're sophisticated investors or traders who purchase assets for short periods of time and employ strategies in order to profit from changes in its price. So it's a really cool uh, occupation, but also suggests that maybe he had a, a, a little bit more wealth at some point. He was also living with Lily, his wife. We, we now know is his wife. So as we update his uh, little family chart, we see that Arthur, we have a birth date in England. He was married about 1880 in Hastings, Ontario, and he died about 1917 in Hastings, Ontario. Uh, so we kind of want to learn more about Arthur, maybe even get some information on his parents. But we really want to know, since he was living for so long in this Hastings, Ontario, what kind of land records did he purchase land in the area since he lived there for so long? So we want to try to look for land records for him on Family Search. So beginning at Family Search, we want to go to the Family Search catalog, which is found under the search button at the top. Once we click into the catalog here, you'll get to this page. From here, you can search by a lot of different ways, by place, surnames, titles, authors, subjects, and keywords. However, the best way to find land records is usually by play, putting in the county. So right here I put Canada, Ontario, Hastings. You can also write, type it in Hastings, Ontario, Canada, and it will still get you to the same place. Once we hit search here, we get to this page. The Family Search catalog is a really great way to see all of what Family Search has to offer, not just those records that have been name indexed. So you can see here, when we get to this page, there's a lot of different record categories, such as cemeteries, censuses, church records, court records, directories, and many more. We want to look at land records, so we have to scroll on down the page. Once we've scrolled down the page here, we can click to open up the land and property section. And that little six next to land and property indicates that we have six collections of land and property for Hastings County, Ontario. And amongst these different collections, you have abstract index books from 1800 to 1959, a couple of different books on land records, general registers from 1847 to 1902, index of land records of Hastings County, and land records of Hastings County from 1800 to 1954. So you can see as I've clicked in a couple of different one of these, they're purple now, uh, but we ended up finding some records in this last one called Land Records of Hastings County, 1800 to 1954. So when I click on that, it will bring us to the collection page. From here, you can see the author, which is Hastings County, Ontario, Registrar of Deeds. This indicates that the, these are original records from the county office, from the county courthouse, the actual deed records here. And you can kind of read through. These are in English. Um, the original format for these land records are in microfilm, um, but they've also been digitized here. Down in the notes section, it's, it's important to kind of read through these as here it gives us information about the indexing for these land records. It says each volume, except volumes A through N of Hastings County, are individually indexed. So what this means to me is that we're going to have to look for an individual index at the beginning of every volume for these land records. As we scroll on down the page, we get to listings of the land records by township. So that's why it's kind of important to look at the censuses, know what township the family is living at, or else you're gonna to have to go, like I did, through all these different townships and cross them out. So I went through all these different townships, it wasn't in any of these. So I kept scrolling forward and ended up finding him in Walston Township in this volume, they only have one volume for this from 1867 to 1894, which we do know 
that Arthur was living in that area during that time period based on the censuses. So in order to get into these records and view them, you can go over on that right side to the camera button and click it. This will pull you into the different microfilms. I've gone ahead and taken us right to the index page for this volume. And you can see I went to the C's since we're looking for Arthur Coe. And right here we find Arthur W. Coe selling land to Ann S. McLaren, David McLaren, and Alex McLaren. And next to that, that little 259 is an indication either of a page or a register number. So you might have to go to page 259 or go to register number 259, which might be on a different page number. Below him, there's a listing for a Mary J. Co., uh, Arthur, Alan P., and Catherine M. as well. Uh, so kind of interesting to see another Arthur Co. there. We want to look at that record, too. And they're selling again to the McLaren family, same as the one above it. And this one is listed on, on register number 260. So these are back-to-back -back land registers. So I've gone ahead and you basically skip forward in the microfilm. And here we find number 259. We'll make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see it better. Here, this record was made on the 26th day of March in the year of 1,822. And this is an act between Arthur W. Coe of the village of Maddock in the county of Hastings. And it lists that he is administrator of the property of William Coe. And down it's selling it to Anne Soley McLaren of the town of Buckingham in the district of Ottawa. She's a widow, also to David McLaren and Alexander McLaren. So I pulled out that information right here on a little sticky note. So again, this is in 1892. Arthur W. Coe is doing it as an administrator for William Coe, which suggests that William has passed away and named Arthur as his administrator for his probate. As we go down further in the record, it now lists that information about William saying William Coe departed this life in test state on the 23rd day of August in the year of 1891. So now we know that William died in 1891 and died in test state meaning he died without a will and he had appointed as the administrator his son or we don't know it's his son yet but Arthur as the administrator to handle all his proceedings of his property. Then it lists that he left surviving Mary J. Coe, his widow, and the said Arthur W. Coe, Emily M. Coe, who is now Emily M. Volume, Catherine N. Coe, Louisa H. Coe, who is now Louisa H. Martin, Fanny J. Coe, who is now Fanny J. Hatch, and Alan P. Coe, his lawful children. So now we find that Arthur is actually William's son, which is why he's the administrator for this property. So we pulled all, all that information out. We know that William died the 23rd of August, 1891. And now we have some relationships for him based on this land record. We know his widow is Mary J. Coe, and we have a listing of uh, five different children, Arthur, Emily, Catherine, Fanny, and Alan. We even have some new married names for the girls. Uh, and as you go through this record, it actually talks about the land. It goes through the land descriptions, but the land being conveyed, conveyed or given to the McLaren family actually goes across multiple townships. There's a lot of different land across these multiple townships, but it's all being recorded here in Wallington uh, count, uh, Township. So from this record, we've learned a lot about the Coe family. We learned that Arthur's father was William Coe who was born in England, and he died the 23rd of August, 1891, in Hastings, Ontario. We also have Arthur's possible mother, Mary J. Coe. We don't actually know her maiden name, so we leave that blank. And she was also born in England. This leaves a lot of different questions here. Um, it also leads us to the idea of Arthur's siblings, Emily, Catherine, Fanny, and Alan. And we might ask ourselves, where should we look next to help confirm our thoughts about Arthur's parents. We wanted to learn more about them now, to learn more about William and Mary J. From this, we now we know we can look in census records for William and Mary. We can then continue to look at land records. When did William first get the land? So we can go back in those abstract index books to find the ownership property of the property. 
and also look more in the land registry records for other deeds. We could also go and see if we can find the death record for William in civil registration. Since it's 1891, hopefully there's death record that we could look at. All right, before we go live, we just want to kind of sum up what we've learned a little bit. Ontario land records really have a lot of valuable information for you, and they can really help you to learn the history and background of the people in your ancestor's life, and also about your ancestor. Make sure to read through everything and evaluate all the information that you get from the record. They could always lead you to everything and anything as your next steps to break through those brick walls that you're facing. Finding land records in Ontario can be challenging, but hopefully we showed you that it's not impossible and that you can do it on your own. So let's go live now to kind of go through a quick example um, that Cindy had sent over ahead of time. So we want to start here at Family Search. Um, we actually started with uh, someone sent in a land abstract book entry for William Gilpoli. I hope I'm saying that right. I apologize if I'm not. Um, and she sent in the land abstract, the abstract index book image, uh, but it was kind of a little bit blurry. It wasn't the best image. So I first wanted to show you guys how to find any land abstract books on Family Search. Uh, like we did in that case study, we're going to start by going to the catalog. So here on Family Search, you want to go to search at the top here and then down to catalog. Once we do that, again, we want to make sure we're searching by place. And it was in Kent County, Ontario. So as you type that in, it kind of fills it in the rest of the way. So you can click that and then hit search. So you can see, just like in the case study, there's all of these different records for Kent County. We had different biographies, cemetery records, church history, church histories and church records, directories, genealogies, a lot of really great records for Kent County. Um, but right here, we have different land and property records. And there's di eight different collections here. So as you can kind of look through all these different land collections that we have, the first one are the abstract index books from Kent County. So let's start there and let's look at the abstract index books. As we click in through here, uh, we can see that we got them exactly from Kent County and that these are index books are arranged chronologically by lot and concession. Um, and so as we're scrolling down here to these film and digital notes, down here in this note column, these are where you'll find the different townships name. Um, this example is in Raleigh Township. So we want to kind of scroll down through here alphabetically. And here we have two different microfilm for Raleigh Township uh, abstract index books. We're going to start with this top one from volumes A through B. And again, you want to click on this little camera icon over here on the right hand side. When you click on that, it will pull up all of these different microfilm boxes. In order to make them full size, all you have to do is just double click on the image. From there, you can use the, this handy dandy toolbar over in the left hand side to make it bigger, make it smaller. You can also go back out to those uh, little thumbnails, uh, but we're going to stay in it right now. As you're looking at this first page, they're all like a, what we we're saying, they're divided by township, but also by lot and concession number. So for these, we're at lot one and concession one. Uh, the concessions go, it goes by concessions and then all the lots in the concession. So it'll be concession one and then it'll go, each page will be lot one, lot two, three, four, and so on and so forth. Uh, they might even break them up by the northern half of lot one and the southern half of lot one. It kind of depends on how much land is being purchased in each area. After you go through the different lots in, in concession one, it will then move on to concession two and then do start over again from lot one all the way to the end. So I've gone ahead and done the hard work of finding where we're looking for for the Gilholy family. It's on page image 385. Let me type it up here. So you can either scroll by page by page with these arrows, or you can type in a page number at the top. So as we get to 385, we're looking at the north half of lot number four, in concession 11 of the Township of Raleigh. And so you can see here at the top, I'll make it nice and big for everybody. 
You have here on the left the names of the grantors, so those who are selling the land, and the names of the grantees, which is those who are purchasing the land. Then it usually gives the description of how much land is being purchased or transferred. After that, it goes through the instrument. So what type of land record is this? Is it a patent? Uh, it could be a will, a mortgage. There's all sorts of different land records, um, and there's all sorts of abbreviations. So sometimes you might not know what the actual abbreviation stands for until you actually get to looking at the land record. Uh, the consideration tab right here is how much the land was sold for, how much land was transferred for. The date of the instrument, so the date that the land was actually transferred to the person. And the registration date is the date that it was actually brought into the county courthouse to register that the land had been transferred. So you can see here for this example, there's uh, the land was the date of instrument was June 19th of 1868, but it wasn't registered until June 20th, the next day. After those two different dates, you have the book and the folio number. So this book number, you can see there's book E, F, K, L. Also right here, there's a book of wills in book, will, the will book A. These refer to the volume number that you're going to be looking at, and we'll show you kind of why that's important in a minute. These folio numbers either refer to a page number in that volume, or they refer to the item number in that volume. So it's important to make sure you especially write down these two pieces of information as you're leaving these abstract index books. They also have registration numbers. Um, these kind of refer to like as, as time went forward, what number were they as they were registered in the county or in the township. And if there's any different remarks, those will also be written here on this last column. So let's come back and we're going to be looking for William and his family here. So the first entry in this, on this uh, Latin concession is actually the crown gifting land or giving land through a patent to William Gilfully and all 100 acres. So that's one thing we could now look for is we could find this patent in the different crown patent books. Uh, and those might not all be digitized. You might actually have to go into the Archives of Ontario or over to LAC to be able to access those. But the one I'm interested in looking at, these three right here don't look like they have anything to do with the Gilholy family. But right here, it says, Honora Gilholy, widow et al. And so that kind of, that sticks out a lot to me. That Honora, we, I knew from this person was the wife of William, is a widow. And the et al is and others. That's it's Latin for and others. So it's referring to other people as well. They're not listing on this. Uh, and then they're giving land to Timothy Gilfoley. So we want to go and look at this land record to see what it's all about. As we go over to the information about where we can find it, we can see that the land was done. This land transfer was done in 1869, and it's found in Book F in folio number 281 and the registration number was 159. So these are all important things to keep in mind. Book F, folio 281 and registration number 159. So you might be asking yourself, okay, that's great that we know this, but where do I go find it? So if we come back to our catalog pages, just click that back arrow, come back here to the land and property collection, there's this land records of Kent County, uh, circa 1789 to 1954, and it's actually found in this collection here. So as I click to open this collection, uh, we can read different information uh, about the records. This collection was actually filmed three different times. So some are partial, some are duplicates. So it's important to check the numbers, uh, instrument numbers, and years covered to avoid missing or duplicating different documents. So that's great. We want to find Book F from Rowley Township. So you can see here it starts with Kent County, then it goes to uh, Blenheim Township, all these different townships and places here. But we want Rowley Township. So we can click this arrow to go over to the next page. Still not quite where we want to see letter-wise. Uh, and if we go all the way to page four, it starts with T. So we need to go back one page and start scrolling down here. As we scroll down, here we have Raleigh Township, and there's actually a full index for all of these for volume A uh, from 1847 to 1898. So this is an index for all of the Raleigh Township uh, land records. Well, we're looking for volume X, 
F, we already know where in the record it is. So we're going to skip the index for now. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F. Here's volume F, which is from numbers 1 to 480. And these are actually the registration numbers that we were looking at in those index books. So we knew the registration number was 159, so it should fit in here. However, as we keep looking down, this next entry has volume B, volume E, and another a filming of volume F, but only numbers 1 through 139. And then it goes down to volume G, and then they again film the other half of volume F from 140 to 480. So theoretically, our record should either be in this one with all of volume F, or it could be in this Rally Township volume F from 140 to 480, since our number is 159. Um, we're actually going to look at this one here. Uh, so to keep it highlighted, you can come over and click the camera button. Once we do that, let it roll load up. Uh, it's important to note how they're listed. It went volume F, then volume G, and then H, and so forth in this microfilm. So we know that it's going to start with volume F here. If we click on this first page of volume F, you can see again, it's number 140. We're looking for number 159. And I've again found the page number so we don't have to search all together. But you could go searching page by page to find the right number. It just goes in chronological order for that registration number. This is actually on page, let me look here, 25 here. So a lot of different records. If we see all the way down here in number 159 and registered the 16th day of August, 1869 at two o'clock PM. And this is the signature of the deputy register, Thomas Mc, uh, McNall, McNaff. And so we can kind of read through the record here a little bit together says this indenture made the 22nd day of March in the year of 1869 between Honora Gilholy of the Township of Raleigh in the County of Kent of the Province of Ontario, widow of the late William Gilholy, late of the same place, yeoman deceased, and then there's a little comma here, it's also Patrick Gilholy of the same place, then it goes Mary Gilholy, his wife, so we have Patrick and his wife, Mary, and it lists James Gilholy at the same place, and Elizabeth, his wife, so James and his wife, Elizabeth, and then um, James Dillon, also the same place, and Anne Dillon, formerly uh, known as Gilholy, so we have Anne Gilholy and her husband James, and then it goes on to, it keeps listing a few more people, I'll scroll down so we keep going, all the children of the and it ends right here with the first part, and all children of the said deceased. So all these people listed above here, um, except for Honora, are children of William. So just from this little part of this land record, we now have a bunch of the children, including all of their spouses' names, and the married name of, of one of the girls. So you get a lot of really good information from there. And then it's giving land over to Let's see where we at. See, except it said Honora and James Dillon. It continues on that the last will and testament did intend to bequeath unto the said party of the second part. And it listed the second part being um, that other Timothy. At least kind of, I think I kind of skipped past that. Oh, yeah, Timothy right here is the second part. So it's saying that it's mentioning the last will of William and the bequeathing of land to all these people. However, they're saying that in the will, maybe Timothy got a little bit excluded from the part of the land. So what they go on to say in this land record, I won't read through all of it with you. Uh, it kind of gives some land over to Timothy from these other people from what they got in the will. So we learned a lot of really cool information from this land record, uh, but we also know that there's a mention of will. We'd really like to find that will in our records. Uh, another thing that this person had sent over was a second abstract book that actually mentions a will. And so we're going to look at that really quick before we go so we can start looking for the land record or the will record. If we come back into the abstract index books, we're going to start with what we were given. And that again was in Raleigh Township. 
So we click on the little camera button next to Raleigh Township. And I went through and I found it based on what the image that they gave to us. It's on page, it's on. If we come through here, this was the image that we were given by one of you here. Um, as we look in over here on this left-hand side, we're looking for William. You can see William Gilhoy to Timothy Gilhoy. And as you go over to the side, you see it says Will right here. That's the type of instrument this is, is a will. And the date was October 10th, 1865, and it was registered December 9th, 1865. It's found in Will Book A, in our the FOIA number 379, and registration number 240. So again, we want to keep those things in mind. Book A, uh, FOIA 379, and registration number 240. So now we're asking, okay, well, where's Will Book A? We just looked at find where the land books are, but where are the will books? So if we go back out of this, come back to our collection page on the catalog, you can actually see under this land and property records, there's firstly a collection called Register the Will and General Index Kent County. However, they're not always under this land and property at, uh, entry. They're usually found under probate. So if you see Canada, Ontario, Kent, probate records. And you can look here and there's different probate records here. So they have a specific collection just for wills, but for those who died without a will, there are different probate records as well that you could look for for your own ancestors. So for this example, we want to go find book A of their wills. So we're going to go into the wills collection here. And as you can see, there's only three different microphones for this. But you can see right here it says register volume A and one through 460. And if you remember, our number for that register number was 240. So it was folio uh, 379, but register number 240. So we want to go into this record here and click that camera button again. And let it load up. And so you can kind of see here on this first page. It starts with number one of these wills. So this number one is a will of John Hooper, but we want to find number 240. So we're going to go all the way. I found it by going page by page through here, skipping around. We want number 240. So as we're looking in the margins right here, you can see, make it nice and big for you guys. Number 240, last will and testament of William Kilhoy. Recorded December 9th, 1865 at 2 10 p.m. And then there's this, the signature of the registrar. And here we have the entire will for William Gilhoy. So through it, it talks, I won't go through the whole will with you guys, but I think knowing just how to find the will is really important through the catalog. It, the will talks about funeral expenses being paid, giving property to his wife. Uh, it specifically talks about giving a gray mare to his son, Stephen. Um, and then it talks about the specific land that needs to be given to Timothy in concession 10 in lot 4. It also names Timothy Dillon as the executor of a will. And then it also lists William Doyle as a witness for the will. So you can see all this great information in the will. It goes on over to this other page here. It lists out multiple different children. And then at the end of the signature of the will, it has when the will was registered in 1865, meaning when it came to be registered in with the county means that Williams passed away by this point. Um, so it can give us some information about his death right before that December, the 9th of December, 1865 is probably when he passed away. Um, so that's kind of how we can go through and find the different probate records through the different land records. There's a lot of really great ways to go about it. I kind of went a fast way through things. Um, but I would love to kind of open it up to you guys for any kind of questions that you might have from here. Um, is there anything you'd like me to kind of repeat or go over again? Just please, please let me know what you'd like. Angela, was there any questions in the chat? Um, just would the PowerPoint be available for people after the presentation at all? 
Um, I won't have the presentation available. We're not allowed to give it out, but okay. um, I do have a handout that I can pass. I can send out to Cindy to send out to everybody um, okay. that has all the same information on it. Uh, so that should be helpful. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you did mention one good point uh, at the beginning before you went live that I really appreciate was your point of read read again and reread it again. So I think that's very, very important. <laughs> Absolutely. It's never too much to read it more and more and more. It's, it's like you read your favorite book. Every time you read your favorite book, you get new things out of it. Same thing with the records. You There's always something that you miss. For sure. I honestly, I was so glued to the screen because I was watching exactly where you were going. So I know I'm going to be watching this again. Um, but that was that was fantastic. I think that was really the first time um, that I was personally walked through. I know this presentation came about because um, in our family history room, there was a couple of us one day that were sitting down looking for a specific thing. Mm -hmm. And we were on the website and we were searching and searching and searching. And it was just, ah, we're getting very frustrated. It's like, okay, <laughs> I just need someone to walk us through this and show Absolutely. us step by step. So that was fantastic. And that was very broken down very specifically. Um, and it was done well enough that it could transfer over to the other counties as well. So that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and the way that I found land records, it, really land and probate records with indexes are very similarly done in the catalog. So kind of as you're, even if you're not looking for land records, if you're trying to do probates, look for indexes, write down the book and the page numbers, and then go into the record from there. It's it's very similar across the board. Mm -hmm. And I know Angela can, Angela can jump in and, as well, but I know that, again, um, getting ready for this presentation, that that's actually what she was doing. So I, I think, Angela, what you had just said to me early was, honestly, this is just practice, 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 and going back and forth and getting the hang of what the collection has and, you know, just trying to uh, getting a handle on what's there, how to find it, and be bopping back and forth between the two. So. Absolutely. I think that's what uh, Angela was really um, going to focus on when we do get together and do our little group is uh, manually going back and forth. So Absolutely. we have one question about how would you handle looking for a municipal location rather than a lot and concession like a town property? So if you're like a town property, um, yeah. I would still, okay, I would either start at the county level and look to see, um, oftentimes as you're looking in these land records, they will either say, it would be a township or it could also be a town in here as well. It might not just be like a township. It could be a town or it could be a city in these different county land records. Um, if the city is large enough, it might actually have its own set of land records. So I would actually go to the catalog to deeper to that town or that city. So, um, sorry, I click around here, but like as you're on this county page, you can actually hit this places within button. And it will pull up all these different towns or townships. So you can actually go into that area. So, for example, if you go to Dresden, you can kind of see they don't have their own specific land records. But you would go into that level, into that town or city level, and look for a land and properties uh, category and open that up. Hopefully that answered that. There's just I know. So, there's so much on this website that you can yes. just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. So that, that's yeah. great. There, there's a lot of really great things. A lot of people don't realize that the catalog is there for people. And once you start using it, it's actually very intuitive as you get started using it. It might seem very overwhelming, but you kind of just you read what's on the screen and follow the directions is the best way I can put it. <laughs> So we had a lady, uh, her name is Dorothy. Oh, she, the, the chat just popped off. She actually messaged me privately um, and said that she's joining from New Zealand. So oh, that's, that's fantastic. Exciting. And she says, thank you. Your present, your information was so informative, practical, and very easy to follow. So that's great. Thanks, Dorothy. Okay. Well, either everybody's head is jam-packed and they're, <laughs> they're already gone and they're already onto their other laptop and they're already tracked it, trying to practice exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> so that's fantastic. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> For sure. We know what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing to be aware of as well is there are some records in the catalog that are locked, per se. Um, 
which means that they're they're more protected records. Most Ontario isn't, especially the land records, because of our agreement with the Archives of Ontario, uh, since they're the record custodian of them. Um, but as you're going through the catalog and find something that says, like, this record is locked, uh, it might mean that you need to go to a local family history center, or I believe that the Archives of Ontario down in Toronto, if you have time to go down there, um, if you're in their, on their Wi-Fi and their premises, they actually have some special access to records as well. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're looking through records outside of land records, outside of Kent County. So with the affiliated library um, program, yeah. so Kent, the Chatham Library actually is an you do? affiliated oh, library. Perfect. Then yeah, yes, so you should be able to access most of them then. Yeah, okay. so that's the one thing that Family Search was generous enough to yes. partner with our society. And I think there's actually quite a few libraries throughout Ontario I that are so. affiliated. Um, so yeah, so if anybody's close to Chatham and they want to come and get those unlocked records, come on into the library. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's good. That's a good point. I forgot about that one. Okay. Are there any other questions, Angela? Uh, no other questions. I do have a suggestion, though, because it was Cindy and I were searching for something. Um, right. Look at different places for that concession and lot number or the address, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's different from what's written, because I think we were looking for something on one concession, but actually the person's registration information was in another concession in the records themselves. Mm -hmm. And I know for a municipal address, I at one point, the street's been switched into east-west, so the, the num house numbers have actually changed over the years. So you sometimes have to go back to those old indexes that Jacqueline was already mentioning to make sure that you're at the right address. And I mean, it's also good to look at like the historical maps and compare yeah. them to the modern day maps. And that will help you as well. I think that, I mean, I showed you some of those, but even here in the catalog, we have some illustrated, some of the historical atlases of the areas as well. So compare them across the board, like you're saying. And I think, Angela, that's what ended up happening, right, is you were bebopping between the yep. maps, right? Because on one, it said they were on the River Thames, but on Concession 1, but they actually, I think, ended up being on Concession 2. Yeah. And it was the map that uh, led you to that. So that was good. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, so use all those resources out there, the censuses, the maps, and like I say, bebop back and forth. So I think uh, we all have lots of stuff to work on this weekend. <laughs> okay well it's uh past eight o'clock and we won't keep people um thank you so much that was yeah really appreciated um someone's just writing down they'll have to check out their john hooper um that, that was their ancestor so yeah people i think are going to jump off and uh, be busy this weekend so. <laughs> <Good. laughs> thank you so much we truly appreciate it and uh, we appreciate your gang down there as well um so pass a message saying thank you so much to everybody and uh Thanks everyone for joining us and we will see you all next month. Thank you so much for joining.